I'm going to take you through a story, and a story is simply <clears throat> what we thought about when we were simply talking about communion. We were like you. Uh, we just wanted to connect to our church, connect to, sorry, connect to our society, connect to our community. And if we're honest about it, it's really difficult. And we sit in church and, uh, and we say we want to do this, we want to do that, but somehow the church seems here and society and whatever we want to do seems here. And we just want to see how, how does that join. So we had, we had a problem like that. Uh, and I thought that um, if you go to, I went to Newbold College and when you were in Newbold College, it seems that if you wanted to solve an evangelistic problem, all you needed to do was to have a small group. It was like everything, see, every essay was about small groups. If I was here, we'd have a small group, we'd have a small group. And then I became a pastor, and I realized that that simply wasn't the case at all. That there was a little bit more than that. So I'm going to talk to you about what it's like to simply struggle and go through the idea of community. And I'm going to tell you my personal struggles of what community means. I just want to thank those who have planned this mosaic um, uh, three weeks uh, with Ewan and then Scott. And I was looking at the mosaic and thinking, which one was I in this? And I, was, and I thought I'd be this one. That would be me, because it's slightly dark. No, maybe I should be that one. <laughs> Who knows? Actually, in England, you probably don't get this joke in here, but in England, I'd, I'd have a black one of these. But there we go. That's another. That's a, that's a different joke. That's a different joke altogether. So, you know, when, I was, when we were talking about um, community, um, there was a song that I, that I came across, and I'm not a massive fan of Bruce Springsteen, but there was this song by Bruce Springsteen, and I played it to some of the guys early on in, on in the week, and the reason we haven't shown it to you is because it's six minutes long. It's six minutes long, and in this song, all the band sings. Normally there's only Bruce Springsteen and some of the others, but all the band sing this song. And when they sing this song, um, it's really strange because some of them are not normal singers. So they have very strange facial things happening. They're like this and there's teeth showing all over the place. And the camera is very much close up on this song. And this song is going to come up on the screen, I hope. And, um, and the words are simply at the bottom, should I, I'll wait for you and should I fall behind, wait for me. And so it starts off, and Bruce Brinkstein starts this song. And he starts singing the, a song and said, we, we walk together, come what may, then come, come the twilight, should we lose our way. If as we're walking and your hand should slip free, I'll wait for you. And should I fall behind, wait for me. And I remember just hearing this song and thinking like, wow, this is incredible, this is, this is community. And I played this over and over again, and the visual is quite incredible because everything is close, and it starts off with his face, then it starts off with other people's faces, and in the end it opens up wide, and they're all holding together, and there's this band, and they went on the road, the E Street Band, and they're saying, if I fall behind, I'll wait for you. And, and I thought to myself, Surely this is Christianity. Would you agree? Are you awake? Are you with me? Surely this is Christianity. In this Bruce Springsteen song of secular music, that surely this is it. That if I fall behind, and that's all I'm going to talk about. That's, that's all I'm going to talk about today. Different stories, different pictures, different images. And all I'm going to want you to have in your brain is this idea that if you spoke to the, turn to the person to your left or to your right or the person to behind you, that if... I fall behind. I know that you're going to be waiting for me. Yesterday we were talking, um, yesterday we were talking, and as we were talking, uh, different people asked me questions, and I said, you know, what if we decided, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, that it's not about, I said something quite, I thought, not revolutionary, but maybe um, a bit annoying, or provocative, I said this, I said, I believe in my experience that Adventism for me has been about me getting myself ready that I've studied the Bible, that I have devotions and I get myself ready because we're looking forward to the second coming and we have to get ourselves ready to go to heaven. But I then went on and said, and I believe Christianity is about us getting everybody else ready. I said, what else? What if we were Christians? What if we were Seventh-day Adventist Christians who just decided that I am taking you to heaven? 
that the only thing we suddenly, you know, in our church, we say this a lot, the only thing we can take to heaven with us is other people. What if all you decided, if one person decided and they looked around and said, you know what, I am taking you to heaven. And this group here, Andrew's here and he said, you know what, I'm going to look, I'm taking you to heaven. And you decided, you're taking that part to heaven. You can't take everybody, but you're just going to be responsible. You're going to take these people to heaven. What if that was the way we thought? Rather than the fact that I just read my Bible and I did my Daniel and my Revelation and we were having a laugh yesterday because I said we do Daniel and Revelation and we have Bible studies and we do the beasts, the beasts, the beasts and we do lots of beasts and then we go to Revelation and we study more beasts and beasts and all these beasts and it's really good because we're vegetarians but we're obsessed with beasts and beasts and beasts. (laughs) But what if we just decided, we just decided that I decided that I am taking you to, I can't go without you. That that would be, that's the way I'm going to live my life. That when you were missing from church, that someone would ask about you and I would be able to know exactly what's going on because I lived in a time when I only went to church uh, and I only saw Christians or Seventh-day Adventists on Saturday, on Sabbath. And the other six days of my life, I had to live on my own. And then you came to ask me on Sabbath, how am I? And I would say, fine. But really, I wasn't. What if we belong to a church? What if Burwood, I, I, I think you're, you're there, but let's, let's, let's say that we're going to move this to another level. What if to everybody in this room, that you could count on them, that you could turn around and count to them, and you know that if I fall behind, I know someone would be waiting for me, that you wouldn't be rushing to get to heaven on your own. We spoke yesterday about the four, these four Hebrew boys, these four friends in Mark, who decided that they were going to take the paralysed man to the feet of Jesus. Imagine if they were your four friends. There's nowhere in the Bible where the paralysed man says, excuse me, do you mind taking me to the feet of Jesus? Imagine having friends who just see your state, see your situation, and say, do you know what? I'm going to take you to a place of healing. I'm going to take you to my church. I'm going to take you to my small group. I'm going to take you to a place where Jesus is just incredible, where Jesus is grace. I saw this line from a song last week. What did it say? It said, If grace was an ocean, I would be drowning. Imagine if we could take someone to this place of grace and grace and grace. Imagine if you had four friends that just decided. What if you were were one of the four friends that just decided, you know what, the neighbour at number one is going to heaven. I don't know, they're they're paralysed, they're smoking, they've got addictions, they've got problems, they've got this. I don't care what's going on. What if you decided neighbour number one on your street is going to heaven? A lot of us are waiting for them to come to us when we need to go to them, like those four friends, and just take them to the feet of Jesus. Imagine if this was the way we lived as Christians, but I'll wait for you. And if I fall behind, I know that you'll wait for me. I'm at a new bold college and we had a, um, I went there when I was fairly old. I'm old. We discussed that yesterday. And so, and so if you're older, like I went to university when I was, what, 39. So when you go to university when you're 39, everybody's young and you feel a bit displaced. And I was talking to Pastor Andrew about it because I heard him, he said something to me and immediately I knew there was something in his voice and in his heritage because I was, there was this community of people there. In England we don't have community, we're not very good at community, we're very good at capitalism, we're very good at shopping, but we're not very good at community. I went to this university and there was this Serbian community and they adopted me and they basically said, you're with us. Have you ever been around people who want you to be with us? Have you ever been around people that when they go for pizza, that they say, I'm going for pizza, you're going to come? And you go, oh, I don't fancy it. Tough. I'm coming around your house. We're going for pizza. (laughs) You ever been around people? I'm going for a prayer meeting. Oh, I'm too tired. Tough. I'm coming around your house. We're going to a prayer meeting. You ever been around people who just simply just think that you are amazing, regardless if you don't think you're amazing? I was around this Serbian community, and they were incredible. They used to call me an honorary Serbian, 
Now, if you know anything about Serbians, you know that I look nothing like a Serbian. <laughs> and Serbians are crazy, crazy people. But there's so much fun, there's so much community, and they loved me, and they took me to... I went to Belgrade, I went to Novi Sad. It's brilliant going to... Um, it's brilliant going to... Um, Serbia with a Serbian because what they do you come out of the airport and they show you the first places they show don't take you where they're going to live they take you where the Americans bomb them <laughs> it's brilliant so you come out of the airport come over oh, where are we going oh this is where you see that hole there that's where the Americans bombed us and they just keep taking you around there before but they're really incredibly friendly I remember being in in Serbia and they just kept feeding me I just got fat <laughs> As we're finishing breakfast, what do you want for dinner? As you finish dinner, what do you want? No, no, no more. No more. No more Shavapi. No more. I can't take it anymore. Oh, well, you think it's good here. If you go to Bosnia, it's even better. These people were just amazing. They said, you must come to Novi Sad. I went to Novi Sad. They just decided. Have you ever been around people who've just decided that you have to be with them? I'm a, not really a people person. I know this is quite strange for some of you. I, I prefer to be on my own. And uh, if you call me, I'll make every excuse not to go out. You know, no, no, I'm busy. I'm watching football. I'm watching Formula One. I'm watching Mark Webber get overtaken again. <laughs> what is the matter with that man? Just drive faster. You know, I, I just love sport. I don't want anything to stay inside my house. I, don't, I do not want to go out. Did you know that in England, did you know that in England, statistically, that the major disease of living in England is loneliness? Did you know that there are statistics in church that say that, um, the, that the only time that people get touched in church is when you hug them? Sometimes you feel it. Sometimes they hang on. It's the only time they actually have intimacy. Well, you know that people in the medical profession know that they build incubators and there's holes and those holes are specifically so babies get touched because the touch is part of the healing process. Do you know that there are people who simply do not get touched, that feel lonely, that feel incredibly lonely. And they, some people are sitting in this church right now, it's not your fault, that I feel lonely, that do not feel part of the community. As much as we speak about it, do not feel part of the community. But it's still our jobs as a church to search these people out. I read these, I read these statistics on lonely, lonely people. It said that isolated people have three times um, more probability of dying than people that have strong social ties. It says bad habits. If you have bad habits, and I've got some, bad eating habits but strong relationships, you have more probability of living longer than people with good eating habits and being isolated. It didn't say this in a statistic, but I'll tell you how I, how I put it together. It basically, to me, it says, it is better to eat Tim Tams with a good friend than to eat broccoli alone. <laughs> that's, that's what it seemed, seemed, it seemed to me. Because community is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important. And we will move on, and as I speak to you, some, maybe some people who are very, um, I don't want to say fundamental, but people are thinking, well, where is God in all this? Where is God in all this? We'll talk about God in this, all this, because it's in our comfortability of community that we're allowed to grow. We had a phenomenal, I was really blessed this morning, you have a phenomenal Sabbath school. I was over there, I don't know if it's the youth, but we had a phenomenal Sabbath school this morning. You've got some really incredible people who just want to talk about God. You've got innovative teachers who just want to speak about God and just express God in a modern way and we had a phenomenal opportunity to speak. There's one of your guys, Liam, I was really impressed with him that he heard a sermon about Jonah and he just expressed uh, what he heard in this and it was really good to, to see that there is growth and spiritual growth within this. So don't think that this isn't about spiritual growth but I've come here to talk about this a mosaic, an idea that we're all built to be together, that we are different colours and, and different sizes but yet we contribute because God has decided that whether you like it or not, God has decided that the body, that his church body, is how he's going to move his church. Whether you like it or not, that's the way it's going to be. So when we started talking about community, we started talking about community, and I thought that we were just going to do, I was, my thing was, what do I need to tell my congregation simply so I can get them to go to small groups? And then I started to read the Bible and then found other things that totally took me off that path. When we started church, there's a book called John Burke. 
And the book is called No Perfect People Allowed. Some of you may have read this book. It's an incredible book. I haven't read all this book, but I, I was really profoundly touched by this book. And the reason I was profoundly touched by this book was in the second to last chapter, it had a title. I've never read the title, I've never read the chapter of this book. I never got past the title. And maybe I should uh, read it. But this is what it says. It says, church, the family I never had. Might mean nothing to you. It says, church, the family I I never had. I never, got, I never got to read the chapter. I just got to the title. It said, Church, the family I never had. The reason I, need, I can't go more than one Sabbath away from my church is because church is the family I never had. Church, it, for me, is what was, is now the bit that's filled my life and filled my soul, that the body of Christ um, the fact that we share, I mentioned that Margie's within our church, and when she was going, uh, coming over back uh, to England, there was a deep loss in our church, because she's family. I hate it when my family leave. I hate going to airports. I, I take my mother to airports, and I'm fairly very polite to my mother, but I try to get away as much as possible from my mother, because I don't want her to leave me, because I hate it when people leave my family. I love going to meet them. church, the family I never had. The reason I never had one, because I was telling Scott earlier, and we were talking about this yesterday, and I don't mind, I'm not on your psychological couch right now, is that I was brought up uh, by parents. Uh, I have a brother and three sisters, and we brought up together. My parents got divorced at 18, and when they got divorced at 18, uh, they informed me that the person that I'd called father for 18 years and hated my guts actually wasn't my father. And it destroyed me absolutely destroyed me. I then discovered my father much later. He's a phenomenal man and the, and the story ends happily ever after and I've got three sisters and it's okay. So don't worry about it, all those at the back thinking, oh no. Oh no. No, not today. And so when I saw that chapter in John Burke's book, No Perfect People Allowed, Church, The Family I Never Had, I thought it was incredible. I thought, wow. Wow, I can have a family again. We, we can start this again. And that's what I love about church, is that we can just do this. That you can go to your pastor and your leadership and you can contribute as a family. You can say, do you know what? I think we ought to have lights and I think we ought to have this and I think we ought to have this and I think we ought to have that for the children and I think you have different things. And you can form and shape because your opinion matters in the family. And so we started talking about family, and we thought, okay, where do we start? And I, and I don't know, I'm obsessed with John 15, 16. Yesterday we were talking about it. John 15, 16 is an incredible text for me. The text simply says this, as you, if you weren't there, I'll tell you. It says, you didn't choose me. Jesus is saying this. You didn't choose me, I chose you. Now that doesn't mean anything to you, but if you come from a broken home, and if you come from someone that rejected you, if you come from someone who thinks you're nothing, this whole idea that God chooses you is incredible. We used to play football, you call it, um, I played, what did, what, what, did I, what did I play, AFL, what was it the other day, and you guys kicked my butt? Anyway, so, you know, we used to play, when, when we were younger, we used to play this game, and what happened was that um, you used to stand you used to stand there a line. I don't know if you do this. You have two captains. Do you ever remember this? You have two captains, and then you used to choose, and you used to choose. And I was fairly good at football. And then you go, oh, Paul, you come with me. And then you, you go the other side. And then do you remember that guy always at the end? He never got chosen. Normally what happened with him, you go, yeah, you go over there. <laughs> do you remember that? Does anybody remember that? Maybe you were that guy. I wasn't that guy. I'm sorry. I apologize. But imagine being that guy and then someday later on you come, you come to the Bible and you're reading the Bible and you're there and, and, John is saying, and, John, and Jesus is saying, I'm the vine, you're the branches, you can't do anything if you're not with me, you need to be connected with me. And, and I just don't want to make things a secret, I want to tell you everything, I want to tell you everything that the Father's telling you. And, and then, this is what I, I just want to tell you something, I just want to tell you something really important. I want to tell you that you didn't choose me. I want to tell you that I chose you. Wow. And, and I chose you. And this is why I chose you. This is the brilliant bit. I chose you 
to bear much fruit. I chose you because you're going to be pregnant, you're going to be fruitful, you're going to be seedful. Amazing things are going to happen around you. And in John 17, Jesus says a prayer. He says a prayer that is crazy. He says a crazy, crazy, crazy prayer. Now when I tell you this prayer, you're going to go, yeah, it's a little bit of a crazy prayer because I belong to a church, or I used to belong to a church where we tolerated people. I don't know about you, we used to go, okay, these are the crazy people, just for example, no, not really. <laughs> these are the crazy people and these are the normal people. And church is the only place where we actually have crazy people and normal people and someone tells you you have to like them. Because at work you go, get lost. <laughs> But church, we have to make it. Some of you even pretend about these crazy people. You think, like, do you know what? Okay, let's pretend. How are you? I'm well. Do you want to come to my house? Mm, okay. <laughs> Jesus says this prayer. This is what he says. He says, Dear God, I want my disciples, including the ones here and the ones to come, to be one. I want them to become one, just like you and I are one. Did you hear that? Amen. This is what he prays. Amen. This is what he prays. I don't know, I don't know who's your enemy. I don't look now. Shh, don't look. <laughs> he says, in this church, dear God, I want these people to love each other. And I don't want them just to tolerate each other because this one's got a personality defect and this one hasn't or whatever and the other way around. I want them not only just to get on, but I want them to love each other. Just like God and Jesus loves each other. That's what it says. Read the text. If you don't believe me and you think, oh no, I've got to like the person across there now, please don't say this. It's in, it, it's in the Bible. That's what it says. And it goes on and says something further. You go, okay, fine, I don't want to do it. He says, well, actually, you've got to do it. And this is why you have to do it. You have to do it because this is how the world knows that you are authentic. Amen. Amen. This is how the world knows that you are authentic. This is how the world knows that you are for real. Because in everywhere else, there is not unity. In your work, there is not unity. At your university, there is not unity. In your playground, there is no unity. God is asking us, as Christians, whether you've only doing this day one or day 101, is asking you as disciples, because Christianity isn't about today. Christianity is not about today. Christianity is not about me and you sitting here, having a good time, having this worship, because church is easy. Today's going to be a phenomenal day. It's easy to do church here. It's easy. It's the other six days when we have to be in our companies, where we have to be authentic, we have to be real. And he's saying to us that the way secular society knows that Christianity is real is when we are unified. And then we moved on, and we moved on, and when we thought about it, we moved on, and we, we discovered this thing that you can recover from a fall. And later on, Walter's going to be singing this song, which is a song that we, we rarely sing in our church. It's one of the only songs. Normally, we're only singing to God. We only sing to God and we praise God. And that's a phenomenal thing. That's, I'm not saying that's a problem. But this song is a unique song. And the words simply go, I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's body. We're all a part of it. And it says that I need you. It's in his will that we should be together. And it says this, I need you. I need you. So when you look around, look around behind you. These people in Burwood Church, you need, the song simply says, you need each other to survive. It is his will. I need you to survive. I don't know if you've ever, ever been involved in things like Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. Uh, 
not by taking drugs or drinking, uh, I don't know how you would the journey, but I've met a lot of people with addictions. And they're incredible people. They're incredible. They have this system. The system is, is that if I'm a sponsor, then I'm responsible for a sponsee. And my responsibility to that person is that if they call me, 20, wherever they call me, I am there for them. If you were to look at Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous and talk to these people, you would think, wow, maybe we should start a church here. Imagine if you were in this church I'm, where you knew that you could call anyone, any time, any problem, any day, with any situation, and they wouldn't hurt you, they wouldn't gossip about you, they would simply be there, Whether, maybe they can't fix it, they'll be able to listen to you. And in listening, you're able to be there, and maybe you just need to be still, be with them and with God, be still and know God, and that you can heal. Because imagine being in a church where you know that you can recover from a fall. I came from a church where the problem wasn't that we couldn't recover from a fall, the problem in our church was that I could never mention that I was fallen. Because we had standards in our church. I don't know about you, you ever been to a church of standards? I wrote on the Facebook um, um, a year ago, uh, and I'm gonna, it's one of the first things I'm going to talk about uh, this afternoon, and I wrote on Facebook, I want to belong to a church where the standards are so low that anybody can come in. 56 people wrote, what do you mean, standards, low, whatever, they just were angry, what do you mean, where the, the church must have some rules and regulations and standards and this and that and whatever, and you know, we can't let anybody in. I heard a story of a church which were actually putting together, um, they wanted to change their name to the community church, like you have, like on your community. And there were people that didn't want to have this name community on their church. And somebody got up and said, do you mean that sinners will be allowed in our church? <laughs> what if you belong to a church where you knew you could recover from a fall? One of the most amazing sermons I ever heard in my life was actually by an English pastor called Robert Ferguson, and I believe he's a, he's a pastor for, uh, he's a teaching pastor at Hillsong, and he came to England, and I was there, and I heard this sermon, and he did this sermon, and it blew my mind, and we, we spoke about this. And, it's based, and he based his sermon on this thing in Luke, on how a father, and in Numbers, how a father carries a child. And in Luke, it says that when the shepherd finds a sheep, that he places the sheep on his shoulders. And then we spoke about that what, it would, what it would be like if you were um, living your life on the shoulders of God. What it would be like. What would our attitude be? We're in a community. We can recover from a fall. We now are strong. We're there. What it would be like if we lived our life on the shoulders of God? Of God. There's a, uh, um, there's a photographer who, what he does, he takes all these pictures and they're all very strange and he takes pictures of things that you know and you see and you think, but there's something strange about it, there's something different about it. And the thing that's different about it is that he takes pictures on a ladder. And so he just sees it from a different perspective. I remember my daughter, I had a knee operation and she was on, we were at a bonfire and she was on one of my friend's <coughs> shoulders. And I could see the bonfire, but she could see other things. What else, what happens if we live life on the shoulders of God? I remember thinking about this and talking to my church. And then uh, I remember thinking about the story of David and Goliath. And we know that story so well. We love that story. There's a little guy called David, and there's a big giant called Goliath, and then, like, you know, the little guy beats the big guy. I don't like those stories. I'm a big guy. <laughs> I don't like those stories. I play basketball. I'm not big in basketball terms, but I don't like those stories. Little people are annoying. <laughs> They're annoying because they always want to hurt you. They always want to prove something to you. The, the most pain I've ever suffered on a basketball court was a five foot five little guy who decided, I'm going to set a pick behind me, and I went like a bam! And he smiled. Ah, the bigger the heart, the, was it the bigger you are, the higher you fall, or whatever they say. I don't like little guys. <laughs> I don't like this David and Goliath story. Some, you know, like, yeah, it's wonderful. It works in biblical terms, but do you know what? 
I don't like it. <laughs> and, but then I, then I then heard the sermon and we were thinking about our church. And then, I, and then something came to me. Uh, God said to me, let's look at this differently. And normally I'd get a child to do this. Is there a child available? <laughs> Is there a child? Come here. Come here. Come quickly. I want, okay, which child wants to do it? Come up. Who wants to come up? Quickly. No one. Normally children always want to come up. Okay. Tall black man won't hurt you. Come on. Come on. Someone quickly. Come on, you come up, sir. You come up with him. You come up with him, Scott. It's good. So that's David. Hey, David. Now, so David comes along, David comes along and there's insults, and there's insults, 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 insults. And I'm insulting, I'm going like, look, there's no way you're going to take me out. You are absolutely, nice jacket, by the way, but you're, you're like, what? There's no way you're going to, you know, way. yeah, nice jacket, yeah. Yeah, you look good. How come do you look, I never look that good at 50, let alone, yeah, no, don't do that. Don't do that. So anyway, so David comes along. And he decides, and this is the thing, yeah, it's mosaic. And this is the thing, this is where the story switches. Is that we always see David as the little one, and Goliath as the big one. But the thing is, can you lift him up for me, and put him on your shoulders? The thing is, is that David is the giant. When you read the story, when you read the story and you see it, you see David as the small one and Goliath as the big one. It's actually David is the giant because he's living on the shoulders of God. So when he's there, he's like, David doesn't see this. David sees someone minute. David sees this and he's going like, he doesn't see this. You may see in your life the big giants. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we wanted, and that's what God wants you to know. God wants you to know that you can live on my shoulders. That you do not have to be, that you do not have to be substandard. You don't have to have bad, low, low self-esteem. That maybe we struggle for self-esteem. But maybe we ought to be reading Psalm 139 and to see what God thinks about us. Maybe we'll never, ever think that we're amazing. In England, I was saying yesterday, in England, in order to be a true man, we have to wear links. Do you have this in this country? It seems as though, in England, adverts inundated. Doesn't matter about your education, doesn't matter if you're nice looking. If I wear links and I keep spraying it, beautiful women and fast cars will come my way. <laughs> it's true, try it. <laughs> ouch, ouch, that's late. that's like, how dare you say that? How dare you say that? Come on. But what if we lived life on the shoulders of God? What if we weren't, you know, um, there are people who think that, you know, if you follow the devil, you can get a Ferrari, and if you follow God, you get nothing, whatever. I don't, I don't know what you get, but what if we just lived on the shoulders of God? What if we just had a just different attitude about it? And that's, that's what we had. And that makes it easier. Then we moved on. We said, okay, if we're living life on the shoulders of God, I'm, I'm a gifted person. I'm a confident person. I see things differently now. I can see the bigger picture. I, can, I'm, I see my value because God values me. I feel selected. I feel chosen. And because I feel selected, I feel chosen. I feel better. And so I can contribute to the body of God. I can give my gifts to this church. Some of you are incredible people. A lot of you just, if we actually did a list of what you did for a living and how much money you earn and the talents and the education you have, it would be frightening. Be frightening. What if you decided, what if we did an offering right now? We got the offering and I gave you loads of post-its and I just said to you, what are you going to give of yourself to God? There's a lady who went, um, I don't know the, the place, the, she gave two weeks of her time. Two weeks of her professional time, of her expertise, she gave to other teachers. What if you gave your expertise to this church? And it's, you know, you just gave it. You said, okay, fine, I'm going to walk out to my past. Pastor Andrew, this is what we're going to do. Okay, I'm a medical doctor, but this is what I can do for you. 
I'm a mechanic, but I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Every car in this church is broken down of all the women that can't do anything with their cars. I'm going to do it for this church. What if, what if, you know, and men, because I'm useless, so let's get the gender thing right. But what if you decided to give of your giving to this church? What if you decided to give it first? That'd be another thing. What if you decided to give it to God first? Because God is all about us giving to him first. He said, give me stuff first and I will give you everything after. What if you gave the best of the best to God first? That's what he did to you. That's what he did to you. I don't, I don't know. What is, I, I walked past this shop called, is it Dave Jones? Does anybody know this shop? Is it Davy? David. Okay. David Jones. What a great shop. I walk past the shop. Imagine, we have these people in England that knock on your door for clothes. Okay? They knock on your door for clothes. And this is what happens. They knock on your door for clothes. And then what you do is that you go up into your cupboard and you go and get the clothes that you don't want. You ever do that? Is it only me? Sorry? Yeah, you get those bags and you do that and go, there you go. Thank you very much. So I can go down to David Jones <laughs> and go and buy some stuff. Imagine. You go to David Jones, you buy your clothes, you walk into your house, and as you shut the door, these people knock on the door, and they say, can I have some clothes? And you give them the David Jones stuff. Is that crazy? Is it crazy? Yes or no? Is it crazy? Put your hand up quickly. Crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. But that's what God did. That's what God did. God, God didn't send down some angel. He gave you the best of the best. He gave his son for you. He didn't go upstairs and go, let me get the stuff, the other stuff, or the dodgy stuff. He gave you the best stuff. He sent Jesus Christ down on earth for you because he thinks you're amazing. You may not think you're worth it. You may think you need links or you may think you need anything else, but he thinks you are so worth it that he gave us the best of the best. He gave us Jesus Christ. Isn't that a great God to serve? And he wants us to know this. He wants us to say, listen, you can stand on my shoulders, that maybe you can't beat giants in your life and you can't beat addictions in your life and there are things, there are relationship problems that are too big for you. He's going, stand on my shoulders. And then we decided as a church, and it, was, it came to the closing of our uh, creating community, it was a five-week five seminar, we decided that, that we were going to talk about the Good Samaritan. I don't know about you, I don't like the story of the Good Samaritan because pastors never come out very well, that one. <laughs> it's true, can't make it, however you make it relevant, you simply can't make it look good, pastors look good. But we decided, and what we decided was that we are going to be people that would never walk by Imagine if you were a church, you've already decided, you're united. You decided you're selected, you decided now we know that God is with us, who can be against us? You, you now, you're on the shoulders of God, you're a giant now, killer for God. And you're going to decide, do you know what, I'm never going to walk by. I'm never going to walk by. I'm never going to step over. Because Jesus never stepped over. There's nowhere in the Bible nowhere where Jesus stepped over in fact he just seemed to have this inordinate amount of time for people where did he get this time he, he was able to just make people if you read the book of Luke Luke is a phenomenal book because Luke is simply saying that the whole um, uh, point of Luke is that Luke is saying that salvation is for everybody there's more mention of women in this. There's more mention of orphans. There's more mention of foreigners. Because Luke is saying that this Jesus Christ is for everyone. It's for crying babies too. It's for everyone. That's what Luke is saying. And so we decided at the end of this community thing that what we would do, what would be the best thing to do? The best thing to do, I thought, would be to have communion. Now the reason I wanted to commune in is that I hate feet. I think feet are disgusting. My feet are disgusting. I've had them for a long time, sorry. 
I don't do feet. There's a woman, evidently, who started a ministry, uh, I don't, don't know what country she had, and she went round the homeless and she washed their feet. I personally think she was on drugs, but I just don't understand how someone could actually do that, be on someone's feet. But this communion is this service where we sit down and we just commune and I touch your feet and I'm being humble. If you were a Hebrew slave in Roman times, you would do anything, but in your contract, you would not wash feet. If you were a Hebrew slave, you would do everything else, but you would not wash feet. And so we thought, what if we washed feet? What if we just washed each other's feet? What if we did this? What if we just humbled? What if we, um, uh, John Maxwell talks, talks about it, called it leadership by the towel. There, there are certain people that you just don't, you don't want them to wash your feet. No, 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 you shouldn't be doing that. Recently, modern churches have now had where we're able to, it was very, you know, male on one side and women on the other. Now, we, now sometimes um, we have a situation, it's not unique to our church, maybe, I don't know how you do communion, where as a married couple you can wash each other's feet. Imagine being able to share the beauty of that. It's, it's amazing, it's wonderful. I, I wanted to do communion because there was one person in my church that we always sort of seemed to great, great to cross. And I thought, that I, I can't really tell you that I love you in a way, because even when I tell you that, you tell me, well, you know, what do you mean? So, I, you know, I didn't, but I, I just knew that it would be great that if we just washed each other's feet. And so we had our first communion. Actually, because of the facilities, we didn't wash each other's feet. And I truly think that we missed out on this. It was a beautiful service, but I just wanted, I think there's something about the fact that humbling, that where we share and do communion, do this in remembrance of me. And so we concluded our whole thing on community. It was done. It was over. I went home and I was happy with myself. I thought, you know what, I've spoken about community. Everything is wonderful. Everything is fine. Let's have another series of something else. I came out on Sunday morning and I saw one of my neighbours. Now, one of my neighbours, she's like basically what I call a misery guts. Have you ever got a neighbour with some misery guts? This neighbour, is it only me? Okay, you've got nice neighbours. I've got this neighbour, she's a misery guts. Have you ever met these people who? Um, I used to have this person, in, I used to work in a business centre and we, I say good morning to everybody because my mum taught me English and be, had to be polite and manners. And every time you see someone, Paul, you must say good morning. Have you ever met people who, when you say good morning, they're like, please don't say good morning. Can't you just walk by? Can't you just leave me alone? Can you just go away? <laughs> I had this woman, I remember, she was working in my business centre. She, I remember one day I was walking like this, she knew I was going to say good morning and she went, no, don't. <laughs> I'll never forget it. And then she walked and I went, good morning. <laughs> I said, don't. I have one of those neighbours that's like, she sees you and she's like, oh no, you're going to say hello, aren't you? And that's all I was going to say. I wasn't going to have a conversation with her. She was just simply going to say hello. I started thinking about this neighbour. I thought I've been talking about community, I was talking about the Good Samaritan, I've been saying all this wonderful concept stuff that I've been trying to share with you. And I was walking around my house thinking about this miserable neighbour. I've got this neighbour just below me, I live in an apartment just below me, and he's a good neighbour. And the reason he's a good neighbour is because his children are very polite. In England we like polite children. His children are very polite. They're so polite that when they come in the summer, they make up different ruses to, to actually uh, earn money. Like, we're going to wash all the cars or whatever. And they never wash all the cars. They wash one. And I think, we're going to wash your car. How much is it going to cost? Uh, you know, whatever you want. And I just give them fiver just to, just to make them think they're amazing. Real money, real money. He's a brilliant neighbour. We talk all the time. He's brilliant. I like him very much because he supports an inferior football team to me, so it's easy to take the mick out of him. It's very easy. <laughs> And so we speak. It's, it's wonderful. I have another uh, um, a neighbour just below that one, uh, um, not across to that one, and he's quite brilliant as well. And the thing that's brilliant about this neighbour is that you ever have a neighbour that you only speak when you complain. So normally we're complaining about the rubbish or something. 
or the parking or something. You ever have a number? You ever have a mem uh, sorry, a neighbour that the only time you speak to them is when you're complaining, and you complain well with them. It's like, wow, we bonded on this one. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. I can't believe they've done that. I can't believe either. Can you not believe? Wow. What are we going to do? I don't know what we're going to do. See you next complaint. It's brilliant. <laughs> this neighbour is fantastic. My neighbour, the other one, I've got this other neighbour by the way, this other neighbour is quite funny. Now this neighbour is a little bit, of an, a little bit not annoying, but she always gets me at the wrong time. There's, a, there's an older couple and as I walk to my car, there's a woman and she goes, where are you going? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm going to church. And normally I'm like that because I'm running a bit late, pastors are always late. Well I am, your pastor's amazing but I'm late. And she's asking, and then, what are you doing in a tie? I'm going to church. On a Saturday? Yes. Why? It's in the Bible. No, it's not. And then she makes me, and then I go, yes, it is. And she goes, show me. Now I'm late. <laughs> I'm late. I haven't got time to do a Bible study. Show me. And underneath my breath, haven't you heard of Google, love? So, quite, so it's okay. Anyway, so we have to, so we come along, and she made me. I had to do a Bible study. I was there. I see this Bible study. It's there, and like, and then, then I went, okay. So you put in Saturday to Sunday into your Google thing, and we'll come back and we'll discuss it later. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I've got this other neighbour, who's the husband of the miserable woman, who's a bomb disposal expert. <laughs> says to me, would you, would, you like to, would you like to come and watch me dispose bombs? I said no. <laughs> but thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs> <laughs> so one day, she was walking down the stairs. She was walking down the stairs some days later, and she had a little dog. And I'm back to the little thing again because it was a little dog. And it's really funny watching big men and little dogs. My daughter, actually, um, I, know, I know that I've taken a lot of your time, but I've come a long way, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> but my daughter decided that she wanted a dog. And what she did is that in, in, in Jamaican households, heritage households, I'm born in England, but my parents are Jamaican, they do not allow animals in the house. Animals are for outside, human beings live on the inside. Never the twain shall meet. My daughter wanted a dog. Daddy, 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 can I have a dog, can I have a dog? Now anybody that's got a daughter as a child, as a father knows that it's tough because you always give in to your sweet little girl. Daddy, can I have a dog? Daddy, can I have a dog? And they know, they just know how to do it. So anyway, I went away to Norway for a weekend. I went away to Norway for a weekend. I came back and I have a sort of office stroke studio because I'm into music a little bit. And she'd taken post-its, and only small post-its, and she spent all weekend. And if you imagine this room with that post-it, seriously, if you imagine a room, not as big as this, but a room, and with the post-its, she put these words, I want a dog. <laughs> In every book, post-it, I want a dog. Everywhere, I want a dog. You can guess she got a dog. <laughs> Problem with this dog was that, so I don't like hairs. You know when you sit on people's sofas and then like you're covered in hairs and like, Argh! I don't like hairs. I, so the rule was that you had to get a dog that didn't have any hairs. So we found one. It's called a toy poodle. So we had this toy poodle. Her name was Talia. She died about a year ago. It's a wonderful dog. And um, my daughter, it was my daughter's dog. The rule was is that she looked after the dog. But like all good children, they don't keep to their rules. And so soon it came that I was walking the dog. <laughs> Have you ever seen a six foot two black man walk a toy poodle? <laughs> it's, it's not good. You never see this look in GQ. It's just, it's just not good, a little tiny thing. And I remember one day I was doing this and I was walking this dog and there was a guy, he was smaller, sorry, <laughs> with a great big dog. <laughs> and he looked at me and he just, he didn't even laugh. He sort of had this like, you know when you want to laugh, but like you're <laughs> And then he looked the other way and I, and I walked in and I was like, never again, I'm never walking that dog again, no more. 
It's not my responsibility. Not having this dog ever again. And so I'm walking up the stairs, walking up my stairs, and this woman, the miserable woman, doesn't want to talk. She has a dog. And so we're negotiating how this is going to happen. Because I know what's going to happen. This dog is going to bite me. Like, <laughs> little dog. Me, Goliath, that little thing. Got to have you. You've got a fall. So she realises this and she's very kind and she lets me go up the stairs with my shopping. I go in, I close my bit, because even this apartment's got this bit here. And then somehow we end up having a conversation. We end up having a conversation. And then I said, I didn't know you had a dog. I said, yeah, I, just got, I got a dog for Christmas. This is about February. I got a dog for Christmas. Yeah, how, how did you get a dog? Oh, uh, my husband bought me a dog for Christmas. Oh, that's nice. Uh, not really. Well, why not really? Well, the reason he bought me the dog was because he was having an affair and he knew he was leaving and he told me after Christmas that he's going to leave me and he left me. And he left me with this dog. <laughs> I just thought to myself, this is awful. I I've been thinking about this woman as just miserable. I've been... You know, she's my neighbour. I'm good at talking about community. I'm good at talking about everything else. But it seems as though the people right next to me, I, I really don't care enough about. And she started for 45 minutes. We had this conversation. And I remember just thinking, how can I preach to you? How can I talk to you when I don't care about the people who live right next to me? And so we spoke, and I said to her, she knew what I did for a living, and the, the reason that was quite funny about this lady is that um, she, she often says to me, you do know, because our, our bedrooms, the way the thing is designed, it's adjacent, she says, you do know that when you're in your bedroom on the phone, I can hear every word you say. And I said, because normally at the evenings or something, I'm talking or whatever, and I said, no, I didn't know that. And, and occasionally now, because I, 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 I forget things, I often think I ought to knock on her door and say, I, I've forgotten the conversation I had yesterday, could you tell me what it was? Because I've, I've got no idea what, what, what's, what's, what's going on. <laughs> and so we spoke for 45 minutes, and this woman told me about her life. She told me about her heart. And I just thought to myself, I can't preach about this stuff anymore unless I really take notice that if I'm going to be a Christian, I can't just do church in here anymore. I'm going to have to do it where I live. Actually, it's going to have to start where I live. I have to decide that uh, not that I'm just going to take my church to heaven. We were talking yesterday, maybe we ought to decide I'm going to take my street to heaven. You know, we have a community choir. And we have this community choir. And there's a girl in there called Mel. We put an advert in the paper, um, and for six weeks we said, do you want to sing? Uh, anybody from the community, they came, we did a concert. The first concert was 150, then the second one was 160. Now it's 220 people from the street just come on, and they just bring their friends and family, and it's turning into this, this amazing thing. And there's this girl who sings in the choir, her name is Mel. She's got nothing to do with church at the beginning. And then she's got this phenomenal voice. And then we asked her, would you like to be involved in one of our praise and worship services? And she came along, sat down, looked at it, and maybe thought it was boring and just left. She's amazing. And do you know what we've decided? We've decided that she is coming to heaven with us. That's what we've decided. We've just decided... That she, now, she went the other day, the other day she went to her husband and she said, listen, if I was to join a church, could it be London Live? Is that okay with you? And he went, yeah, that's okay. It's been a year now. She's sung three times with our praise and worship team. I, she hasn't been to church regularly. I'm not going to pretend that it's, it's baptism or anything. That's not what it is. It's just that we've decided that she is going to come along with us. I decided that day that that person who I perceived was miserable even though she was broken, even though she was busted, I decided that she is going to come along with us, that we're actually now going to pay attention. We're going to pay attention. I'm asking you to pay attention. You know, this mosaic is incredible because, you know, it's, it's beautiful. 
but a lot of stained glass windows are very just... If this broke, then we would know how to fit it, but some stained glass windows, they're just all different broken bits and all busted and broken and bruised. And if they put it back, it might, it might not fit properly, but God says that I want you to be part of the body, I want you to be part of this body. That there are people that come up front that you may think of ahead and I want to be like them and I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm the pancreas or the spleen of this church and you might not think you're significant but you matter. And that you do matter. And while you do it here we want you to know that you're significant in this body here because we want you to know that this community, whether it be Victoria, Melbourne, wherever, wherever your influence is, that it matters, that we have this attitude, that I now have this attitude to my street, that if they fall behind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait for them. I'm not just going to just drag myself. This isn't about me just getting to heaven and going like, da-da, I'm here. It's not about that anymore. It's about the fact that as you empower yourself, as God empowers you, he's asking you to empower your community, he's asking you to empower your world. Because in Matthew 25, in closing, he simply says, where were you? Where were you when I was hungry? Where were you when I was thirsty? Where were you when I was naked? Where were you when I was in prison? Where were you when I was a stranger? There are people who are going to say, but Lord, we did incredible things for you. We did the most amazing Sabbath schools for you. We did the most amazing sermons for you. And he's going to go, well, what, must, what else should I do? Where were you? Where were you when that, where were you, Paul, when that miserable woman, and you thought she was miserable? That wasn't why she was miserable. Where were you? Where were you? I think God simply asks us to pay attention not just to his church, he asks us to pay attention to his world. He asks us to reach out. It's tough. You don't need to be more qualified, you don't need to know more about evangelism, you need to be braver about the stuff you already know. You need to bring someone along. This is a great place. This is a, you've, got, you've got great facilities. You're great people. I've, you know, I could, I'd love to pastor this church when Pastor Andrew decides he doesn't want to pastor. You can have my church. We can do a swap. I'd love to pastor this church. It'd be brilliant. Come to my church. Come to Burwood and come be part of the family. Come part of the building block of this church. Feel comfortable. I don't know anything about Daniel and Revelation. It's okay. Come and join. We'll teach you. We'll join. We'll journey with you. Because the only thing we take to heaven with us is other people. That's what we do. Walter's going to come up and he's simply going to sing you a song. The words say, I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. It is will that every need be supplied, every need of your community is supplied in this body, in this mosaic. Every need is supplied. Everything, there's a problem in this community, there is someone in this church that can solve it because you are a solution to a problem. It, it is will that every need be supplied. You are important to me, you are important to this church. I need you to survive.